Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Development Discourse, where we ideate for Africa's development. My name is Patrick Okibo, founding partner next year. Next year is a multi-competency advisory firm focused on solving complex development challenges. My guest today is a very rare Nigerian. Um, there are not many Nigerians with such bulletproof credentials as a political activist. Yet, when he secured his seat at the heart of power, uh, he continued to speak truth to power. Salihu Muhammad Lukman was the president of the National Association of Nigerian Students from 1988 to 89. In 1991, after his youth service, he became the national secretary of the Committee for the Defense of Human Rights in Lagos. Later that same year, he was elected the founding deputy general secretary of the Campaign for Democracy working very closely with the legendary Beko Ransom Kuti. In 2002, he became the Education Secretary of the Nigeria Labor Congress, where he worked quite closely with Adam Soshemole. Um, in 2006, he returned to Zaria and founded the Movement for a Better Future, a platform for community organizing and development. From August 2009, he served as the CEO of the Good Governance Group and later joined a group of 54 Nigerians that initiated the Save Nigeria Group. He was one of the early members of the Action Congress of Nigeria, where he ran for a Senate seat in Kaduna North in 2011. He was one of the architects, you know, one of the brains behind the merger um, of the three or four political parties that became the All Progressive Congress and saw its electoral victory in 2015. You know, something that is quite uh, quite unique, strange, uh, unheard of, you know, in, in Africa uh, for an incumbent political party to lose an election. Uh, he became the director general of the APC Governors Forum or the Progressive Governors Forum. In that role, he was the brain and soul of the APC philosophy, if one exists. And, you know, we're, we're going to get to that. He sought the nomination of, for APC Governor of Kaduna State, later rose to become APC Vice Chair North, resigned from that role, uh, another very rare thing to, to be seen in Nigeria, over the plans of the party to impose candidates. This resignation came after several fights, some he won, many he lost, um, within the APC, fighting for internal party democracy. You know, so there's no one better qualified in Nigeria today to discuss our topic for today, which is internal party politics and Africa's democratic future. Salihu, welcome. Thank you very much. And thanks for the privilege. Although a number of the things you said, I'm not sure I can own them. <laughs> well, we, we get we get into all of those. Uh, like I said to you earlier on, um, I've got a lot of things I want to cover with you because I've been looking forward to this opportunity to talk. But let's start from the beginning. You know, you're one of the most prolific public intellectuals in Nigeria today. I'm not sure there's any week that goes by that you don't post like two essays on WhatsApp on topics of uh, of democracy and development. So, you know, that seems like a good place to start. In your view, what is the best argument for democracy as Africa's preferred an optimal political system? I think I think the starting point, we have to begin to stress our steps. I mean, uh, from 1998-1999, I think the emphasis had been in terms of choices of candidates. Mm -hmm. you know, and um, the assumption is that when you make the right choice, the question of good governance, the question of democratic development, they will all fall in place. But the reality is that um, when you ignore the machine or the organization that is supposed to put in place the regulatory framework that will determine the process that throw up the candidate itself, uh, it creates a problem. And I think this is where, although in 1998, 1999, we started on a note whereby you can say there is some level of sanity in political parties, the party that emerged at the time. 
because to be fair to them, they they were holding meetings. Mm -hmm. and to some extent, you will say maybe when decisions are taken, everybody respect those decisions. But as we, we move along, and I think the degeneration started from around 2003, there about, when we heard that former President Obasanjo had to struggle to win his second term nomination. Correct. And from there on, I think he took a conscious decision to really ensure the party is subordinated to him, mm -hmm. you know, and that he is fully in charge. Mm -hmm. And it got cascaded down the line. At state level, governors also took the same measure. And the whole question of internal contest was completely blocked. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, from 2007, there about even the emergence of former, I mean, late president, Eradua, for instance, you know how it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, internal contest within PDP was clearly blocked. And at state level, people just, in fact, there are records, there are reports about some aspirants who are bought forms. Before they got to the venue, they were told the process has been concluded, you know. <laughs> And that became the political culture. And honestly, it cut across all the political parties. So when we started advocating for merger and the whole campaign for change, part of the thing that many of us had at the back of our mind was that these are some of the issues that must change based on which it will be possible for people to join political parties and compete and the process of competition regulate the conduct because how you now sell yourself to win the support of party members will determine your loyalty, your commitment, and a whole range of things. Now, sure. you're, 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 Salih, you're, you're, you've gotten into the point where you're assuming that democracy is the best system for us. I'm even questioning the concept of democracy as the best process for ensuring development. And as someone who's written extensively on this, I'm, I'm looking for, convince me that we're not backing the wrong horse. You know, that this what, democracy- what, 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 what you are, My response would be to say, at this point, we can only work with, with some set of assumptions. Okay. And one assumption is that, look, democracy is supposed to be representative. Mm -hmm. You know, you are supposed to have representation. And on the basis of that, you are supposed to have a say through your representative, which means it is expected that there will be some measure of responsiveness, mm -hmm. which imply that, for instance, like now, I mean, uh, I just uh, finished reading your last post about uh, blackout, which is yeah. true, you know, and that is part of my worry. You know, mm -hmm. we are having a democracy which is not quite responsive. Mm -hmm. You cry, you cry, you cry. In fact, you can't even access leaders mm -hmm. and parties are not meeting. So in some ways, the question to ask is that, are we truly having democracy? Is the yeah. variant of what we have truly the democracy that is supposed to be in place? Mm -hmm. My response is to say no. And we're okay. not going to go to that unless and until we focus on the right thing. If you remember, between 2007 and 2011, 2015, the main focus of civil society and a number of us as activists was around the question of reform in INEC. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, some major of reform has taken place, but the truth is that it's almost like the whole principle of garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, was the process, I mean, as it is now, uh, let me be very blunt, we clearly don't have political parties in place. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, because we don't have political parties in place, even if you have the right condition in INEC, uh, those who are supposed to be the uptakers 
-hmm. of what INEC is doing are going to pollute it. Mm -hmm. And the end product will not be what is being expected, which is the clearly the issue facing us. Now, my advocacy, which I mean, in the last maybe four years, five years, have been focusing on that, is that look, before we get it right as a democracy, before we have the kind of democracy that will be responsive and truly representative, we have to focus on at least producing a party that will respect its own rule and will allow for internal competition. And when it takes decision, those decisions will be binding on all the elected leaders it has produced, which so if you remember, if you remember, so, so, yeah, go ahead, complete the thought. No, mm -hmm. if you remember around 2020, before 2020, in mm -hmm. fact, I, I think around 2018, 2017, inside APC, the debate about party supremacy, in fact, since 2015, when the Bukola Saraki rebelled mm -hmm. and people were, and some of us have to draw attention that part of the thing that led to that rebellion and made it to succeed was that. The, the, there was no party decision. There was no decision of organ. There were individual sentiment of leaders. APC did not convene National Executive Committee meeting, for instance, where it now say, okay, this is our decision with respect to the set of leadership that will be produced for that generation of as National Assembly. And that was why they could rebel and nobody, I mean, if they go, to, if for instance, anybody attempted to discipline them and they go to court, they will win because they didn't, they didn't break any rule, you know? Sure. And for me, and this is the point I have been making in the last two, three years, that look, what we have in APC, we have an APC that doesn't respect its constitution. It doesn't call meeting, you know? And so long as it doesn't call meeting, what we, all the complaint we've been having around the fact that uh, it doesn't appear as if uh, President Aswaju, for instance, is doing the needful to translate the renewed hope agenda into policy, policies plan of government. Uh, nobody could check him because no meeting is taking place. And sure. invariably, what you are having, he has become almost, I argue that, like a philosopher king. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw that in your last post where you even used a much stronger term. I think you, you said he's governing as if he's a dictator. You know, exactly. but before, before we get to that, there are some arguments that maybe we need to just rethink the entire democracy, right? If democracy is working, it's almost like the system is not fit for purpose for Africans, right? What's your what's your take on that? Can democracy work in Africa? If it cannot work in Africa, should we be thinking about a new way of galvanizing our different worldviews and fighting for development? If yes, what could that look like? I I I think I think my argument will be to start with there was indication that democracy can work in Africa, at least in the 60s. And coming down to Nigeria, for instance, the set of competition, forget about our complaint about ethnic and religious differences. Mm -hmm. We have had a situation between 1960 and 1966, whereby leaders of our different region translate our differences into some competitive uh, reality. Mm -hmm. You know, a situation where, for instance, Dr. Namdi Azukwe, who were uh, in the Southeast, will push for the kind of development that has happened, producing industries, producing even educational institutions like uh, uh, University, University of Nigeria, Nigeria mm -hmm. in Suka. And in the Southwest, we have people like Aolo pushing for the kind of development that has taken place. And in the same thing in the North, mm -hmm. where the Samodi uh, Pello and Sabaka uh, Tafa Balewa were able to push for development. Now, for me, I think 
I think what has happened was that somehow, somehow within that period, instead of allowing a situation where we are able to engage ourselves, renegotiate and have something that go beyond what they were doing, we now allow, I mean, maybe the generation of military rulers at that point felt frustrated, which even our generation, when we were growing up, so reason with what the military did. And in some ways, we almost rationalize why that First Republic has to go. Now, coming to Second Republic, of course, some of the very, very rascally behavior started manifesting in Second Republic, whereby, for instance, it is possible for the whole process of competition to be truncated and uh, become corrupted so that people can induce to emerge as candidates. Those are mm -hmm. the period when all those things started. And I think nothing has happened so far. For me, part of the major thing we need to do is to be much, much courageous to say, look, okay. a number of these things, we must open them up for negotiation, for discussion, you know, and we must have the confidence to test whether certain things will work or not. Part of the problem, I tell you, why, for instance, in the First Republic, it is possible for democracy to produce some development, was that also the generation of leaders at that time were relatively young, you know, so they could be a bit much more adventurous. Now, right. we are having a situation where gener the generation of leaders now, I mean, are already on their, in their 60s, so <laughs> capacity to adventure is weak. Energy. You know, energy levels are low. There is even no energy level. I mean, look, 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 look. I have said it over and over. If Nigeria is to move forward, we almost need like an activist president. Mm. A president that if there is a flash of problem anywhere, he will appear in the next minute and sit down with all leaders around the place and take decision, which will now become instruction in terms of what needs to be done. Exactly. Other than that, and when you are a leader in your 60s, your 70s, your capacity to really do this will be weak. You know? exactly. So this is part of the problem. But perhaps it doesn't disqualify leaders in their 70s to continue to exercise leadership, but they need to blend it by bringing people in that band of age and trusting them and giving them the kind of regulatory uh, parameters whereby they must deliver. If they don't deliver, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like setting up a company, for instance. Sure. When you set up sure. a company, yeah, uh, you know your target. If people you hire are not giving you that target, you fire them. Exactly. That is what is expected. So my, my key takeaway from your response is, and it's something I've been pushing quite lately, that we need to be bold in and confident in trying things to see what works. I, I mean, that's the underlying story of the China success, yeah? Yeah. And I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that is the experiment, that is the APC experiment, because it is probably that same boldness that got you guys at the time, 2014 to 2015, to look at such strange bedfellows and think that you're going to couple them into a political party slap on a name progressive on it, and then have you as the mouthpiece to keep reminding us that this is a progressive party when there was nothing that we could see that says it's progressive. You know, it was almost like you felt that if you kept shouting that it's progressive, that that would make it progressive. So if, is that the experiment you set out to, to do? And if yes, how is that playing out? Let me correct you. I mean, look, I'm not the I'm not the spokesperson or the mouthpiece of the, the merger. Yes, I was an advocate for it, and I believed in it. Now, at the time of the merger and up to now, the vision it was a vision, clear, clear vision, to have a party that is truly progressive. And I tell you, in terms of the vision, the idea was to have it oriented ideologically as a social democratic party. 
And the model in terms of practice is supposed to follow the Nordic uh, experience. You know, and if you check, the Nordic experience has produced a situation whereby, for instance, they are almost in the leadership of the world when it comes to social development, issues of health, issue, issues of education, you know. And that is why uh, the lifespan of people in the Nordic countries is almost the highest across the world, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was the vision. But we were very, very clear. We understand, I mean, a number of us know the limitation of our leaders, limitation of President Buhari, limitation of uh, President Aswaju now. We know those limitations. But we were much courageous to believe that with them, we can negotiate and really produce a party that will be substantially different from the PDP and other parties that were there before APC. Now, between you and I, um, the only good thing that has happened in APC is that we, a number of us have had some level of freedom to continue to engage, to continue to contest, and to continue to critique when things are not falling in place, you know. And somehow it has produced a dynamic which I mean, we can interrogate in terms of whether that is a healthy dynamic or not, whereby when leaders fail, they can be removed, you know. Whether after removing leaders, we are able to now find our bearing and begin to now go back to the vision that will produce the Progressive Party is another thing entirely. And it's produced some level of frustration in many of us. Because for instance, I give you a typical example about myself. After getting, after struggling to get Abdullah Adamu out, on account of the fact that structures of the APC have been frozen and that we need to allow those structures to work, we need to ensure that the party respects its constitution. I mean, the first shocker, which I have expressed publicly and I'm still expressing it, was a situation where the choice of successor, successor to uh, Senator Abdullah Adamu, I mean, was anything but democratic and was anything but also progressive. Because in the first place, it presents some major of injustice against the people of North Central, North, I mean, North Central, you know. Uh, and I don't think a progressive party should be associated with that kind of decision. And I say so without apology to anybody. I still respect the decision because it's a decision of an organ. And I respect both President Aswaju and President, I mean, and uh, uh, Dr. Ganduje. But mm -hmm. for me as an individual, if I'm going to help them, will be to push them to do the right thing so that they succeed and they will be on the right side of history. As it is, if care is not taken, they are moving on the wrong side of it, which is why I say, said they are moving toward self-destruction. So let me let me ask a question because you've been you've been at this battle for a while. You know, um, the Adam Sushumalu led uh, APC uh, under uh, Adamu, etc. What are some of the factors that enables this? I can't call it real internal party democracy, but allowed some of those victories of you know getting some of the national chairman out but then made it difficult made it difficult for you to go the full hog can you help us unpack it because i think no, that's I, the core I, I, essence. I, I, I think i think let's get it clear you know in the first place no one set out to start struggling to get any national chairman out when the advocacy started and um, it was basically about getting them influencing their decision to do the right thing. I mean, with respect to Comrade Adams, my position was simple. Here is a man whose major strength is that he's a negotiator. He's mm -hmm. one of the best negotiators this country has produced. I have worked with him for 16 years, and I, I know what he can do. And at the time he came in, was a time when the party really, really had problem in internally with leaders. If you remember, it was around the time of the 2019 election. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And there were problems across virtually every state. We are having leadership crisis. And I felt at that point, what is needed is to get him to deploy his negotiation skill, sit down with a number of the leaders in Ogun, leaders in Imo, leaders in Zamfara, in all the places, and reconcile them. I knew that was something you could do. Unfortunately, there was some major of resistance on his part. And I mean, even though I'm close to him, I can say I couldn't assess him, you know, mm -hmm. made effort, made effort, you know. So, and that was how we now begin public advocacy. And by the time the public advocacy start, ego trip coming. Because the question of who is this one, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who is behind him. And the whole thing about a uh, smear campaign to now say he's doing the hatchet job of some people. He's a pet agent. Now, at that point, my attitude is to say, well, look, I can't be blackmailed. I knew what I'm doing. And everybody know, including those who are being alleged to be sponsoring me, they knew I had no discussion with them. So we continue. And somehow, somehow, in no time, the, situ the situation got I mean, gain traction and other leaders begin to now raise other issues. The court case against uh, Comrade Adams in Edo uh, became an issue, which held the party almost on a standstill. So that got him out. Now, between honestly, the conclusion of most of us in the party and leaders in the party were that the only way to bring the party back will, have, will be to clear all members of the National Working Committee and put in a caretaker committee. And the argument was that about two years before the next, three years before the next election, it gives us some level of sanity to do right. things before the election madness setting. Unfortunately, yes. Uh, I mean, My other goodness. set of madness come in, the caretaker committee. Uh, got lost, started doing things. So we had to now begin to fight the caretaker committee. And eventually we succeeded in having election that produced Senator Abdullahi Adam. Mm -hmm. Now, the other madness setting about consensus presidential candidates mm -hmm. and what have you. We had to fight that. So we, we were basically doing like catch up, you know, and in doing that catch up, it took us away from really, really sitting down to do the right thing. Correct. And now, what is very clear, I think many leaders in the party are beginning to think in terms of their security, their electoral security. You know, uh, when election come, how will I have a strong say to either become the candidate or produce a candidate I control? And one that is the case, Nobody is interested in whether the structures of the party are working or not. And the bigger issue with political party is about regulating the conduct of elected representatives to deliver on the manifesto of the party and the campaign promises. Mm. You know? And once meetings are not taking place, the party will be weak in achieving that. Mm. Which is why now, Everything depends on the initiative. And we have, look, 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 part of the crisis in Africa, which our democracy must correct, is that we produce leaders who have little or no experience. And there is no strategy to guide them to begin. Experience in what? Experience in what? In leadership. Okay. I mean, you produce a government. In, in leadership or in, in party politics? No, I mean, both. Because let me give you a typical example. Uh, at two levels. At one level is, for instance, you go for a convention and produce new set of party leaders, okay? Now, a number of them are sponsored by potential candidates. Mm -hmm. So they just see their responsibility as elected leaders of the party as being there to guarantee the emergence of their sponsors. Correct. Without necessarily looking at the provision of the constitution of the party in terms of what their broad responsibility should be. Now, in terms of orientation, I think strategically, 
there should have been a situation where immediately after election of leaders of the party, you put everybody in a room, maybe for a week, go through the gamut, assemble people who can provide that guide. The other thing is at the level of elected representatives. Now you elect a governor, maybe that governor at best was a legislator or a commissioner, you know. He may have from a distance seen a governor acting. That does not necessarily equip him with the mentality in terms of how does he initiate decision that will translate to the right set of projects that will deliver on his or her campaign promise. Now, part of the tragedy we have is that we end up with leaders whose major priority is in terms of how they liberate resources that will benefit them. Mm. Mm. Did, did you try to address this in the Progressive Governors Forum? I know that the Nigeria Governors Forum from time to time tries to organize these trainings and so on. Did you do any of those? If yes, what were some of the lessons from those? I think, look, look, look. What we did, because the Progressive Governors Forum emerged with a clear vision and the generation of governors that really took that decision gave us like a free hand to do quite a number of things. What we did is to put in place programs, you know, that will translate into like, um, uh, how do you call it? Experience sharing, okay. you know, yeah. we, we meet with secretaries to government on quarterly basis, for instance. Mm -hmm. And we have what we call like, for instance, governance lecture series, yeah. which is also like on quarterly basis. It's supposed mm -hmm. to be on quarterly basis, but we didn't do, I think we're doing it almost like once in a year. Mm -hmm. And after all the, we will identify a major challenge because what were we working? What is the mandate of the Secretariat of the Progressive Governors Forum? Is to facilitate the evolution of policy synergy among APC states so that mm -hmm. there will be some common policy harmony that will be identifiable with those states. Mm -hmm. Now, I can tell you, for instance, one of the things, the first thing that emerged was the model of uh, security trust fund, which we got from mm -hmm. Lagos. Lagos State has an excellent model of security where they mobilize resources and through that they were able to work with all the arm of security agencies to strengthen them to deal with security challenges. And given the nature of security challenges in the country and in many of our APC states, we thought that is something. But part of the problem we have, I must mention, is the fact that we didn't develop strong buy-in, I mean, the capacity to have strong buy-in of the party. Mm -hmm. Because if the party would that will have once they buy into it, that can now compel on the governor and the state government as its own policy, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit weak. I mean, and I, I, I don't think we were able to do much. This would be my own critique in terms yeah. of what we were able to do. But in terms of the vision, I think it's the way to go. It was a difficult thing to negotiate, but I think it is possible to achieve it. Okay, so let's let's zero in now on internal party politics. Um, and how would you define this for the layman? And why is it important? Why is it a critical component of democracy and development? Um, let's clarify when we say internal party politics. You know, uh, internal party politics is largely have to do about all the process at two levels. One that regulate the conduct of elected representative to deliver on the mandate as provided in the manifesto of the party. Mm -hmm. The second is the process, which is where people focus on, that throw up candidates, mm -hmm. you know. And again, if you look at all the constitution of political parties, 
there is supposed to be a regu uh, regulation that will determine all those processes. But across all the parties, uh, even in the last uh, release I made, I highlighted that we seem to just hand over the process of the emergence of candidates where we have a governor, the governor is in charge, he take control yeah. and uh, he become like uh, the God mm -hmm. who put things in place. Where we don't have governor, there are some party leaders who exercise that authority. And that is where we are getting it wrong. You know, and that is what is producing. In fact, it's what has produced the frustration that led to the anger against PDP. Mm -hmm. And somehow, as APC, we have felt because those are some of the things we need, we should have changed. Mm -hmm. We have failed to change it, mm -hmm. you know. And internally, I, I tell you now, I mean, we, are, we have had a situation where uh, practically governors don't allow even people to buy form or party leaders don't allow people to buy even the nomination form, you know. And this is happening because the structures of the party is not working. Now, if you talk of internal party governors, mm -hmm. I mean, look, we are expected to have a National Executive Committee meeting, which is the second highest organ, which should have been meeting every three months. So far, I mean, the leadership where I was elected, we were elected in February, I think is it February or March? I think Feb March, March 2022, okay? Mm -hmm. We had a neck only in April. After that neck, we never had another neck. Mm. And that neck was just to adopt uh, fee for nomination form, for the mm -hmm. 2023 election, adopt what we presented as proposal for the process and the timetable and what have you. And that was all. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, there was no other neck until August last year. Mm -hmm. After that, August last year's neck, no other neck. We are supposed to have a nat national caucus, which comprises, it's a, and it's supposed to be a consultative platform. Mm -hmm. where if people have complained, they can go and lay it and decision can be taken. At still level we are supposed to, they all don't meet. So mm -hmm. now I think in terms of internal party governance, the first thing is to have some level of sanction. Okay. That if a party leadership failed to convey meetings of organ as provided in its constitution that should be sanctioned against that leadership. Otherwise, we are not going to move internal party governance from almost the anarchical situation we find ourselves now. Because internal party governance must rise qualitatively to the point whereby immediately after election, we are beginning to ask elected governments to present their policy proposal for debate and adoption on the mm. basis of which, for instance, one is become a decision of the party. Anybody appointed as ministers is binded to implement it. Okay. So now, we are nowhere there. Mm -hmm. as can, can we get into the how? Because the, the point you laid out and you lay out this you know, these types of points in the book, you know, uh, APC and transition politics, I hope you can see that, um, and many of your writings. How, how, do you, how do you sanction party leadership that is in cahoots with national leadership? You know, in fact, you, you said it here that sometimes the governors or uh, these po political elite select people who would, you know, work in their favor. So how can, because who's going to sanction? Is the party, is, is the national government that could sanction the national the party leadership? But if they're in cahoots, how would that happen? No, uh, but I think this is where I want to be blunt. First, the, the notion of producing rational leaders doesn't exist. 
And the notion of trusting leaders is faulty. Mm -hmm. If you just produce a situation where it's based on uh, expectation of rational, having rational leaders, mm -hmm. or trust that trusting that leaders once elected, they will do the right, you are not going to get it right. Which okay. is why if you go through uh, my recent recommendation, I keep emphasizing about returning to the waste panel report. Mm -hmm. You remember, waste made strong re uh, recommendation for political parties regulatory commission as part of his recommendation for unbundling INEC. Mm -hmm. And I think we should have that because, I mean, look, if you look across all the parties, the madness that is going on is largely and if you expect out of that madness you'll produce any good leader you <laughs> must be a dreamer you need a regulatory commission that will well the what do you call it knock the head of leaders and say no 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 you have gone out of place and if possible even get to the, empower the regulatory commission to have the powers of charging people to court for because certain certain action in political parties are criminal mm -hmm. we should be able to get that regulatory commission to take party leaders to court now you are having a situation and that is why you have impunity all over the place somebody will sit somewhere write result of so-called primaries and audaciously have the uh, confidence to face the public and say when no everybody know no primary are taking place. But how how is this regulatory commission different from all the other institutions we have? The Supreme Court, INEC, the police, all of these institutions are supposed to act as checks and balances on other arms of government. How will this one be different no, in, in, in a country see, where see, go ahead? My understanding, my understanding is that the regulatory commission will take part of the function of INEC and have the power to be able to directly relate with parties and have some kind of supervisory mechanism on okay. the basis of which when things are not done, just like, for instance, INEC had the power to call and say, give us uh, your audit report. If they give, if you give, if a party give INEC audit report, INEC had the power to even query it and even ask their own auditor to go into it. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, instead of just a loose mechanism as it is now, because INEC supervise, attend all the meetings of parties. INEC attend all primaries, but they have no power. Even when parties make contradictory claims from decisions that are taken, at meetings where INEC is present, they cannot, I mean, they don't have the power to go to court over that. Sure. So part, part of the power of the regulatory uh, commission, political party regulatory commission, will be that they can enforce decisions that they substantiate, and they can take every measure, including going to court, to enforce such decisions. What are one other point you made, you know, quite strongly in the book is to have some kind of a code of conduct um, exactly. for, I mean, for the political look, parties. So look. I like the idea, but again, I'm stuck with this. I can't get beyond the fact that we we, we are hostages, <laughs> you know, we're, we're hostages to the political elite. And it's almost like saying you're going to put in place a code of conduct for these people to check their actions. But they're the ones, I, I don't see how it, so help me understand how it will work. Well, first, first, to free yourself from your hostage mentality, <laughs> you have to be adventurous. You have to believe that certain things are possible. Okay. If you take as given that you can't do anything about it, then you remain a hostage. Mm. For me, and I, I tell people, sincerely speaking, part of the reason why I write I write some time to regain my sanity. Because when things happen, 
that I see are completely wrong. And I don't know who to go and talk to. If I write and share it, you know, I sometimes I share it without even expecting anybody will give me feedback. But when people start, I say, ah, okay, so that means people are able to listen. And also, I think, I think you need to, I mean, the best way to free ourselves from that hostage mentality is to believe certain things are possible. Mm -hmm. And to believe that, look, people, those who are creating the problem don't have the power of finality, mm. you know. And we must contest it. It's our inability to contest it that gives them the audacity to continue to do what they are doing, you mm. know. And it comes with prizes. I mean, look, 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 look. I would like to you. I mean, a number, if you are going to do that kind of thing, you must be ready to make all the sacrifices. Exactly. But for me, Capacity to make sacrifices is a function of capacity of individual to plan their lives. Mm. Part of why many of us fail to make the needed sacrifices to push leaders to do the right thing is that we are overwhelmed by challenges of survival. Mm -hmm. You know, when, for instance, you are having a wealthy family, you know, and you are having so many mouths to feed. Your capacity to make sacrifices that will lead to the loss of your job mm -hmm. will be weak. You know. So no. my advice, to people, if we are really, really, really going to get to the point whereby we are able to force people to do the right thing, because look, the whole question of uh, coming back to the question of code of conduct. I mean, look, I'm in the party leadership when we were expected to have a meeting to produce a guideline that will guide the emergence of leadership of the Tens National Assembly. And the next, I went to the party office, I saw it has become almost like a warehouse. Aspiring candidates were sending bags of rice, bags of sugar <laughs> and what have you. And people are seeing it as normal. As, and, I felt scandalized because I felt as party leaders we are above that. We can't chip in ourselves. Now, this how, how, would it, how would the code of conduct solve that problem? Ah, look, look, look. For instance, if a code of conduct crime criminalizes it, and it's not a new thing, go and read constitutions of parties in the First Republic and the Second Republic. I was young in the Second Republic. I can tell you. Um, another time there was no candidate don't pay uh, fee to political parties. Mm -hmm. I think the fee is to INEC. I, I remember it was PRP. Mm -hmm. in, in, uh, a candidate who was earmarked for House of Reps. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was given he's going to emerge. You know, but there was a fee to be paid to to Fedeco then, it Fedeco. Was Fedeco, not INEC, mm -hmm. you know, and I think the fee was, is it 100 Naira or so? Like now that. the party yeah. was taking it time to mobilize the resources and pay on behalf of all the candidates. Now this guy got restless and went out of his way and paid the 100 Naira without, I mean, directly to Fedeco. Because of that, the party sanctioned him and uh, didn't give him the ticket to contest. Somebody else contested. Now, this is the, look, I tell you, part of the thing that must be done for you to achieve all of this thing, and I want us to discuss that as part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. Funding of political parties are taken for granted. You know, parties have no source of funding, which is why they depend on some questionable sources. Elected officials. We, we must address, if you read, I mean, my recommendation is that, look, sincerely speaking, there is no reason why APC as a ruling party cannot mobilize, cannot have a budget of at least 100 billion naira annually, on the basis of which it is able to sort out 
issues of condition of service for party leaders from national down to world level. You know, remuneration packages and what have you. Now the question will be, how can the party mobilize that amount of money? Mm -hmm. And I think this is where for me, coming from the background of civil society orientation, I know the, the first thing is, for instance, APC claim to have membership of over 41 million or so, okay? We have not sorted, none of our members is paying subscription. Mm -hmm. There is no decision about subscription rate. So the first thing is for APC to decide on, if you now decide, for instance, annually, subscription, a member will pay 1,000 Naira. Yeah. Membership fee, 1,000 Naira subscription annually. Mm -hmm. Plus, multiply that by 41 million. Yeah, but 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 that 41 million is not is a fictitious number, right? Yeah, they, no, they, of course, they, you and you and I know it's a fictitious number, largely because I mean, which is why, for instance, anytime the party say it is organizing direct primary, I question it. Because for you to organize direct primary, you must have a verifiable membership register. Register. A register mm -hmm. where everybody who is expected to vote. Mm -hmm. will be certified as qualified to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't have that. We started the process in 2014. We had the data center that we were doing that somewhere in Lagos, in Ikeja, but the PDP government attacked it since that attack. We never got back to it. When mm -hmm. we did membership revalidation or whatever in 2020, you know, under the caretaker committee. The expectation was that we will return to that. But we didn't, you know. Uh, so it's fictitious, but it, nothing stops us from having a verifiable membership register. And so, for me... <laughs> that something stops you, sir, because you don't have it. You know, it makes sense. Every other political party in the world has it. But for some reason, Nigeria is unable to have it. So... The, what I'm trying to understand is what is that something that has stopped the APC, the PDP, even the Labour Party, you know, from oh, and and it's one of your it's one of your recommendations, you know, member uh, member recruitment, leadership recruitment, you know, you've written about it. It's not like it's not in public domain. Why have we not done it? If we don't understand why, then we can never do it. Why we have not done it is because we have allowed the culture of impunity to take over political parties so that they can produce a candidate without all this record. If you tomorrow have decide to say, okay, the first, I mean, look, 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 there is go to INEC and check the Electoral Act. The Electoral Act stipulated clearly qualification for registration of political parties. But the whole question of membership of the political party is again uh, taken for granted. The main thing is that the party must have leadership that uh, draw people from at least, is it 24 states of the, of the mm -hmm. country? Uh, mm -hmm. It must have a registered pol uh, office, blah, 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 like that. Like that. So if we now factor the having a verifiable membership register as a qualification, all parties will put it in place. And this current madness will stop, mm. you know? And related to that, which is, which is why, I mean, the... INEC has so much to do. And I agree with the OAS panel to say, unbundle it and transfer a number of this function to a dedicated commission whose business will be to ensure all these things are in place. So I, I want to get to the brass knuckles of this. And by the way, you know, for our participants, um, please share your thoughts or questions. And you know, we will read them out and uh, give uh, attribution to who, who put it forward. But you see, I've read, I've read you extensively over the last few years. You know, I, I read your book. I see the ideas. I understand them. They make sense theoretically. The theory of it is right. What I keep struggling every time I read them is 
the practicality of it. So you talk about like mass participation, have your uh, member register and so on. I mean, I'm not calling anyone out. You know, I'm just going to mention Ashiwaju because he's the president today. Yeah. It could have been a Jonathan, it could have been a Yaradua, it could have been an Obasanjo, right? If they are not convinced that having this mass participation, you know, having the register will favor them, why would they empower an INEC or a regulatory body or whomever else? Why would they allow that? And as someone who has been within the political party, who has fought consistently, you know, to improve democracy within the political party, what are the, some of the lessons you have learned from your many battles that can help us begin to think from a very practical point of view, how to get these things done? Look, one of the lessons I learned, if you don't fight for certain things, you will never get it. If you remember, up to 2011, I think it was under Maurice You, the situation mm -hmm. in INEC was quite hopeless, very, very ho hopeless, you know. And it was almost at the point people were resigning. Look, there is nothing, this democracy is law. I mean, it was like just to find all our fears before 1999. Mm -hmm. Because a number of us wrote up this democracy. Mm -hmm. But once there was agitation. Look, I don't know, may God rest his soul, uh, let President Eradua. I, 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 it's really difficult to really explain how he come to the conclusion, having won an election, uh, to now say, look, this election is not the best that has happened. Mm -hmm. We must do electoral reform. He was a beneficiary. Ideally, he should have looked the other way. So there must be, if there was no prejo, I don't think he would do so. I but think, I think prejo... he was a man of character. I think he was a man of character. And yes, exactly. prejo, yeah. So, but we can we can we put our whole hope on finding this man of character? I, that's not what my social no, science no, no. has taught no, me. No, 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 no. You see, you see, everybody has some quotient of character in him or her. My belief, which is why I keep arguing, I mean, look, I have not lost hope with President Aswaju. But I think so. I have said so, but I believe the challenge before all of us is because whether we like it or not, up to 2027, he will remain our president at the minimum. Mm -hmm. So, it's only when we sit up and engage him. Now, my frustration, which is reflected in what I sent out yesterday, or is it this morning? My frustration is that many of our leaders appear to be comfortable, you know, and in being comfortable, they are also being shortchanged mm -hmm. because there are many of our leaders who are above the current level of recognition, you know, and mm -hmm. ordinarily, if meetings are taking place, they will have a bigger say in the direction of government. So my belief is that the more pressure you put on leaders, the more you recover some of their good character to show mm. up in mm. the way they run affairs of government. Mm. But once you give up, then if you are not lucky, the bad side of them, that will continue to show up. Exactly. Exactly. So I have a I have a question, a comment and a question from Jesse Dinju. Um, he said, I have followed Mr. Salihu and the values he stands for, and I am very proud of him. The fact that I'm saying this suggests that when political leaders or political figures like you stand for truth, there is a mass of people that you directly or indirectly influence positively. Uh, and I think so you need to be, you know, you need to be proud of that. And then he goes on to say, do you believe the problem with the political parties is a microcosm of the bigger societal problem of grave decadence in our values as a country? If yes, please give details and recommendations for your position, please. <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> First, let me... Let me thank 
Jesse for his kind words. Um, but definitely the problem of political parties are a reflection of the challenges we face as a nation. Um, in terms of recommendation, honestly, I think this is what we have been discussing all along so far. Uh, it's not easy. I think part of my bigger recommendation is for people to summon the courage to really join politics, mm. you know. is I tell you, we have the current mess lately because a number of us vacated the scene in 1998, 1999. Exactly. I know in 1998, 1999, parties were shopping for candidates. Mm -hmm. It's not like now. And in 1998, 1990, I tell you, with less than 100,000, you will pick ticket of all the political parties to contest for governor. Mm -hmm. Not even House of Reps or House of Reps with 20,000, you can now. But because we have allowed wrong people to go into it, they have converted it into their personal uh, mill ticket or whatever, you know, converted public, public resources into their personal asset, you know. And that is why we are doing this catch up. I think my bigger recommendation to even get a number of the other recommendations tested will be for many people to join for and it doesn't look people must not wait until they are ready to contest election unfortunately this is what is weakening our politics most people join politics only because they want to contest election mm -hmm. i would want to see a situation where people become active in political parties simply because they want to have a strong say in decision-making process of how gov governments controlled by parties are run or even how elected representatives conduct themselves. Well, how this can they have that say? How can they have that say if the political parties do not convene meetings, if there are no no, I am I, I want us, I want I want us to see the positive side of it. Okay. That this look, my position is that something has to give. Mm -hmm. This country can't continue the way we are now. I believe in not too distant time, and I am hoping under the current dispensation before 2027, things will begin to change for the better. We mm -hmm. must come back to the business of organizing political party. I mean, how do you look at now? We are having a situation where people are crying about hunger. Mm -hmm. The party that is ruling the country is not holding even caucuses meeting with interest group to see how that is managed in a way that doesn't produce anarchy in the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, something just has to give. I believe in not too distant time, parties will begin to come back. I mean, we, we just have to change. that, mm -hmm. And I have confidence in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's a there's another question here. Um, although it's from an anonymous attendee, um, do all parties have to be national? Do all parties have to be national? If parties with specific subnational focus constituencies are allowed to be registered, won't that mitigate the challenges of financing and capture or elite consensus, and maybe even become a channel, a platform? For more accountable alliances, what's the pro and the con um, around this idea? I think this is a, this is a very good question, and I, I think even in the question of uh, producing parties that claim to be national, um, I, I think we can interrogate that further, uh, because so far, I mean, part of the problem why parties may have to be national is in the requirement of producing at least members of their executive from 24 states. Mm -hmm. I think that is provided in the electoral in the electoral act. But I have seen, I mean for instance, NNPP uh, has only one state. Mm -hmm. Abga. Mm -hmm. Abga, the same thing with Abga. 
So mm -hmm. to the extent that the, an Abga, I mean, it's almost for more than a decade controlling just one state in the southeast. So more than and, more than two decades, almost from the beginning of the democracy. Exactly. Yeah. So to that extent, you can argue that Abga is clearly a regional party, you know, mm -hmm. and to some extent, I mean, look, we even have parties, even NNPP, for instance, you know, up to the time of the merger, it was more concentrated in the north. Uh, ACN was more mm -hmm. a southwest party up to the mm -hmm. time of merger, you know. So I, I, I honestly think these are some of the debate mm -hmm. we must have, you know, and Part of the, why we must have that debate is why must we constrain our freedom in terms of our exercising our political rights uh, to subsume it to wider national dimension? Mm -hmm. Because inability to engage those debates is producing some of the anger, the, the making many people feel frustrated with even the country. Some of the argument for, uh, I mean, there are some argument that you see now people make the point, why must we remain as a nation? I, I think it's a reflection of that anger. And I believe that the way to go is to really open up and engage this debate, you know? And for me, look, 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 is. I think the question can be expanded to say, why can't we even have uh, independent candidates? Why must we have candidates only produced by political parties? You, you took know? that question off my roster. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe I have some witches which are peeping in their roster. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, this are, this are debate we must have. And honestly, Part of our frustration with this democracy is that these debates are not taking place. And which is why I'm, I'm asking the question that, look, why did we even fight against the military? Because the military block us from having this debate. If we are having a democracy that is blocking us from having this debate, then it loses its value. And mm -hmm. I think we must summon the confidence that we are debating them does not mean we are breaking up. I'm mm -hmm. not a supporter of breaking up, you yeah. know, but I believe we must respect respect the view. If I can convince people who are for breaking up, it's through the debate. Mm -hmm. And it's when they see, I respect them, I respect their opinion, and actually they can get what they want by engaging everybody in the country, in the space called Nigeria. That is how we can preempt them and get them to come back and really accept and be loyal to the country called Nigeria. And most of the most of the people who argue for breaking up, you know, is because they feel that they don't have a voice. They feel exactly. that their issues are not being um, accorded any consideration. Um, exactly. And I, I agree with you, you know, that if we have these discussions and if we have an, a, a way of ensuring that everybody's views are heard and their challenges taken care of, we can build a more united Nigeria. But I have another question from Emeka Diru, and it's good afternoon, sir. Uh, what three things should political organizations that are interested in strengthening, um, or organizations that are interested in strengthening political parties do to promote internal party democracy in Nigeria's political party system? So if there are some organizations out there that want to focus on this, what are some of the three things you know, they, should, they should focus on? I, I, I honestly, I mean, uh, this uh, reminded me of some of the debate we had when we were campaigning for merger. Mm -hmm. One of the things that um, we recommended was that political parties should have caucuses, you know, interest groups, because the whole thing about political is about aggregating interests. All right. You know? And um, there is no reason, I mean, APC, for instance, has youth wing, women wing, uh, persons with disability wing, you know, but there is no structure to it, you know. Um, and I believe there are even professional, I see many professional groups 
uh, largely I mean perhaps because APC is a, is a ruling party, they want a handle to engage government APC control. I, I, I believe we should expand the whole notion of caucusing to have even those professionals as part of a group that is formally recognized by people. So I think my first recommendation to a maker Diru would be to say that, look, they must push for a situation where internal within parties, parties recognize caucus groups as caucus, you know, and those groups can really, really, because for instance, how do you support a political party if you don't have a handle that you will say this is a group that you are supporting on the basis of which they can engage government and negotiate certain policy direct. For instance, I mean, even recently, there are decisions about supporting farmers and what have you. I mean, these are loosely, how can, I mean, I have argued, not in the book you showed, I have argued in the past that why can't APC as a ruling party be also interested in terms of the support it gives to groups mm. by way of ensuring that that support translates to some major of electoral advantage. Now, you invest a lot of resources in terms, billions of Naira, for instance, in terms of fertilizer or seedlings or whatever to farmers groups. Now, if you do so loosely, and at the end, they may even themselves, they may not know they are hurting themselves if out of small anger, they turn their back and go and support another candidate. Mm -hmm. Now, groups, organizations who are interested in strengthening political parties must find a way to strengthen the focus of political parties to allow groups to operate. Because look, look, look. All the thing about democracy loosely, if it is just about producing candidate, and even when the candidate wreak election, we have no option but to work with such candidate, mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. not make us to hold the candidate accountable if there are no group within political party who can tie such candidate down. Any other thoughts on that? On what? Okay, I mean, you know, he asked for three three things that these organizations can do. Well, I I, I think I gave only one so far. You know, <laughs> I, I mean, it's a difficult question to really respond to. I must yeah. admit, but mm -hmm. it's a very very practical question. Yes, you know, and I I I I want to encourage and make a duru to really test the waters by really summoning the correct mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and part of it. Look, 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 I will advise, don't make the mistake because many and uh, sometimes it's some of our international organization that make that mistake to say they want to support all political parties. Mm -hmm. Now, you end up not supporting anybody. I think make your choice, identify any one party. For me, look, the state we are in this country, if it is one party, that will be democratic internet. I think we need to have it. But it's difficult to pick a party to support because these parties do not have any philosophy. They don't represent anything. They are all the same. There's no, there's no real substantive, although you may disagree because you're writing kind of positions APC as progressive, but I don't see anything. No, 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 no but you are, you are wrong. You are, you are wrong yeah, in that. I, I admit that we are yet, it's still, it's just a vision up to now. Okay. And I keep arguing and highlighting what we need to do to become to more progressive. Mm -hmm. Progressive credential of APC. Did you That's attempt did you attempt to help APC articulate its viewpoint, you know, what it stands for, its core philosophy? Is there any effort in the APC to even have a document, even if we have to debate that document? No, I, I think, look, 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 I think there was attempt because during the merger, because I was there, I can tell you, the merger was a product of really, really strong internal, internal debate. And I, 
I, I highlighted this point several. Those internal debate aggregate to the wider national debate. If you remember, I think it was 2014, we even had a conference in mm -hmm. Hilton, you know, where a number of some of the researches were presented, which led to the prior, three priority areas that APC picked for the 2015 campaigns. Yeah. You know? uh, but that we find ourselves where we are, I think is part of the challenges. Mm. And sincerely speaking, coming back to the question of uh, it's difficult to pick which party, it's all a function of choice. I think people must assess the potential in terms of pushing parties in particular mm -hmm. direction to mm -hmm. produce the kind of outcome that mm -hmm. people are expecting. You know, once you make a decision, you know it's a risky thing. You can win, you can, which is what is happening to us in APC. But you must also be stubborn to continue to push, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's not a debate that can end immediately. In fact, yes. it's not just a debate for now, it's a lifelong debate. Mm. <clears throat> let me let me put this up because I don't know if you can see it. Uh, no, you can't. It's the, the title of the book is uh, APC and transition politics. And uh, there's been a, there's a question here on how to access the book. I know it can be found in bookstores in Nigeria. No, no, I, 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 think, I think what will happen, uh, people should send me their phone contacts, mm -hmm. you know, and I will arrange to, 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 to get it across to them. Okay, I will, in, in, putting, out, uh, in putting out the transcripts of this, uh, discussion, I uh, will put your email uh, so anyone yeah. who's interested can reach out. We have a question from Jamilu Rabiu. Um, he's a PhD student at Kenyatta University in Nairobi. And he says, do you think people will subscribe to pay for party membership, uh, membership fees, when they have less say in the party, um, particularly on the issue of candidate nomination? At the moment, People have lost confidence in parties in Nigeria. How do you rebuild this confidence? Well, I, 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 I look, once, I mean, it, it can't come on, uh, with an isolated decision. For instance, if you remember, take you, take you back to our discussion about the whole thing with respect to political parties regulatory commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, one that is done and you see that there is new era. And as part of that new era, you know, you parties are expected to produce membership register. And it is very clear, just like in the case of INEC, I have argued before, long ago, I said, look, the vision of having direct primary is the most excellent vision. But just like INEC does, before every election, you publish voter, voters register mm -hmm. so that people verify it. If there are problems, it is rectified. So also with respect to political parties, you publish the register, maybe at what level, and let it be verified. And once it is verified, people see, okay, we are now the voters. And of course, it is specified that, look, for you to qualify, even for your name to appear on the register, you must pay your membership fee. Correct. You know? Now, those are some of the processes that will build confidence and begin to take us away from the current uh, lawless reality whereby people don't see value, which is what Jamilu is complaining about. And I am mm -hmm. confident is that it can be done. You know, we must not, because we are having the present reality, believe that it cannot be done. And I think it can be done, you know? So let, let's, let's bring the discussion up to the continent. Um, it, we've seen in the last 
three three years or so, uh, a spike in coups, especially in our neighborhood, the Sahel. Um, it's uh, we've seen in the Afrobarometer studies uh, an increasing number of Africans uh, saying that they are not sure that democracy will deliver the goods. Given Africa's checkered history and experience with democracy, what gives you that abiding confidence that this system will or can work? Now, um, and I, I know I asked this question before, should we instead avert our minds to a new political arrangement? Um, if yes, what could it be? If no, what's the, what's the argument to Africans who are losing faith in democracy for them to hold on that this, this experiment, this thing we're doing will ultimately work? Okay, let me talk like a conservative. I think it's, uh, it's uh, better, there is this common saying, the devil you know is better than the angel you don't know. You don't know, correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, because I know what we have now, and as a person I have risen to the point I can engage it, you know. It's not the best, certainly, but I think we can make it better. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to the issue of uh, spikes in coups and what have you, I, I, I think what that tells is that it should serve as a warning to our leaders. Many of our leaders believe they can do anything and get away with it. Mm. And it's, it's really, really frightening, you know, in all the places where, I mean, take Niger Republic, for instance, we've seen it, people in the streets celebrating. It's a reflection of bad governance, you know? I mean, here we are in Nigeria with all the promise of renewed hope. We are practically, I've said so before, and I'm not going to shy away from saying it. We are practically like dash hope. I mean, in the last one week, the state of electricity supply, even in Abuja, is certainly worse. You know, people are hungry, as I have argued in many of my writings, that as it is now, in the last six, eight months, income of people have crashed to less than 25% 20, of its value before the last election. Mm -hmm. And there is no end in sight because we have not produced a clear policy plan that tells people this is the trajectory. This will be the end of things. Mm. And in this kind of situation, and honestly, the society is populated with so many mad people. It just takes the madness of an individual. I mean, I don't think I don't think any society, I mean, we have experience of coup. Those who execute coups don't consult anybody. Mm -hmm. Now, in the current madness, I don't know. I, I don't think we are, we are going to help ourselves. We just sit down and think it's not possible for that to happen. Mm. The deterrent to it, and we must continue to appeal out to our leaders and continue to push that our leaders must do the right thing. Mm. And the right thing is about allowing us to engage leaders and influencing their decision, mm. you know. And for leaders to have some measure of humility, once that is, even if there is hardship, citizens will recognize that is that hardship is not the product of decision of this particular leader, but the leader is working to solve it. I think that is the way, the way to go. And I, I, I agree with you. And I'll just pose this last question from one of our participants, and maybe in answering that, you also just kind of wrap it up um, because we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee, and he says, how do we get political parties not to be... Anonymous. It's Hubert Shein. Oh, you, you know who it is? 
<laughs> I can see his name. <laughs> okay, he shows anonymous uh, for me. Uh, anyway, oh, it's okay. uh, you get political parties to be active outside of election cycles. A number of suggestions seem to allude to that. Um, appears to be an ingredient for creating active citizens. So far, it doesn't seem citizens, party members, and non-party members find political parties useful other for, for uh, other than you know during elections. You know, any thoughts or comments on that? Well, uh, look, 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 look. I, I think this is part of the wider frustration, really. Sincerely speaking, there is no, there is no answer that will immediately open up the space. We have to be dogged to continue to challenge leaders and challenge the setup. And I, I mean, because. People, I mean, part of the last part of it asks whether the issue is about ditching presidential system for parliamentary system. Honestly, my, my view is that whether you produce parliament, whether you change the parliamentary system or not, will not change what we have today. Yes. You know, the Critical would take us back to where we started, if you remember, about making Indeed. political parties functional. Once political parties are not fun functional, you will continue to have what I call close setup. Mm -hmm. The whole system will be closed, and leaders will be acting as dictators. They will be practically like philosopher kings, which is what we have produced so far, succeeded in producing so far, you know, mm -hmm. and to change that is to really, really struggle to produce political parties that uh, that will be holding meetings. All organs of the party are meeting and taking decisions, and their decisions will be binding on elected and appointed leaders on the basis of which you now have the incentive. Because if as a member of a political party, I see that my view is translating into decision of an elected governor, for instance, or a president. Huh? I'll be I'll be more committed to attending party meetings, you know. But like somebody, I think it was uh, it's Jamilu who has made the point. Like he has said, there is no incentive now mm -hmm. because whether you are, I mean, they don't even hold the meetings in the first place. So. I will argue that opening up the space is a function of how dogged we are. And we must be ready to make all the sacrifices to force our leaders because some of the blackmail our leaders will always do is that we are looking for appointment. We are looking for contract, you know, and that if they don't give us, if we still talk, they say we are frustrated, you know, <laughs> because they don't give us what we want. And we have to put cotton wool in our ears and just continue <laughs> engaging them, you know. That way, uh, I am confident it may take us another year, it may take us five years, we'll get there. But yeah, yeah. like I've argued before, something just has to give. Yeah. This country can't continue the way it is. This democracy, if it is to survive, it must be useful to in the whole question of improving the lives of citizens. And if that is to happen, political parties have to be very, very active. The space has to open up. And um, I, I, I couldn't have summarized it any better than that. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Salihu uh, Mohamed Lukman, uh, for spending this time with us to discuss internal party politics, governance, and Africa's democratic future. And for everyone who joined us today, Thank you so much. And in another two weeks, we'll have another enriching uh, discussion. This time with Jude Uzomwane um, uh, in, on his book, The First Trillion, you know, where he lays out how Nigeria can become the first trillion dollar uh, economy in Africa. Thank you so, so very much for always joining us. And thank you very much, Salih, for making time. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the opportunity. I'm really, really very grateful. You know, I look forward to continuing continuous engagement. We must produce functional political parties in this country.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Much up. And please keep writing. Eh? We're reading. Keep writing. <laughs> well, I, I think that is my only source of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir. And thanks, everyone who joined. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Yeah. Bye.